I'm worried about how my AI application handles sensitive data, like personal information. Well, there are some ways you can protect sensitive data in AI apps. Let me show you how. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for joining me today. It's been a while since you and I shot an episode together. Uh, would you please remind viewers what you do here at Google? Hey, Martin. I'm a security advocate, and I talk with large customers all the time about how to run secure and compliant workloads in the cloud. Now, many of these customers are asking about how to secure their AI applications. Very good. Uh, I hear a lot of those questions, too. What specifically do you want to know about? All right, so let's say an organization has a long employee handbook. Employees have questions about policies, uh, but they don't want to read the whole handbook every time. Right, got it. Yeah, I heard the average employee handbook is 10 to 50 pages long. Right. So this organization is building an AI application that employees can use to ask questions about policies. Uh, for example, an employee might ask questions like these about the vacation policy. Yeah, that sounds like a useful application. Yeah, I think so. I wish I had one. <laughs> but they want to make sure none of their employee handbook goes into some other training data set where it might show up outside of their organization. Uh, they also need to make sure that their questions that their employees want to enter stay within the organization. Right. Those are very important concerns. So first off, I'd say Google Cloud does not use customers' data to train its own models. A customer's training data, like the employee handbook in this case, belongs to that customer and is controlled by that customer, not by Google. Um, you can read more about this in Google's AIML privacy commitment, in Google Cloud's uh, Terms of Service, and our Cloud Data Processing Addendum. Google has also published a white paper specifically about generative AI and privacy. Very good. Uh, I'll include links to those resources in the video description. So Aaron, uh, you just described how Google Cloud handles uh, this kind of data. How would an organization that builds AI applications on Google Cloud safeguard the data in those apps? Sure. There are three main data flows in AI applications where you may want to remove sensitive information. One is data going to your model. Two is the logging that's done by the application. And then three is the response to the user. OK, so there are three data flows, and there may be sensitive personal data in any of them. Uh, how do we handle that? Depending on the workload, you may want or need to remove personal data from these data flows. Fortunately, you can apply one single solution for all three. Google Cloud provides a service called Sensitive Data Protection, which has the Data Loss Prevention API. You can run text and even images through the API to redact sensitive data. You can also set what types of personal data you want to let through and what types you want to filter out. So I would just apply the Data Loss Prevention API to all three data flows? That's right. Let's have a look at each flow. Sounds good. So the first one was data going to your AI model. Uh, what's the risk here? Well, if your AI model doesn't need a user's personal information to work, it's best to filter that kind of data out. It should filter that data out before it reaches the model. OK, uh, what might be an example? Well, you mentioned an application that can answer people's questions about an organization's employee handbook. Right. So if the user enters personal data, we want to filter that out. Here's an example of a question that contains an address. And here's the same question with the address redacted by the Data Loss Prevention API. Very nice. Uh, what if the application accepts image uploads from users? Hey, the Data Loss Prevention API can also redact sensitive data from images. Here's an image of a sample driver's license. And here's that image after the Data Loss Prevention API has redacted the license number, name, and address on it. Ah, that's impressive. Uh, and this is an API you'd call from your application code? That's right. So here's some example code that calls the API. There are client libraries for this API in the most common programming languages. Could you add a link to the documentation from this video? Uh, yep, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, I will include a link to the docs and the sample code in the video description below. All right, so that was the first data flow. Next is logging. Right, Aaron, I was wondering about that. So how might personal data enter the logs in the first place? Many organizations log the inputs and outputs of their applications so that they can debug any problems that show up. If they got alerts or bad responses from an application, engineers want to see what went wrong so that they can fix it. 
Right. And for a conversational AI application, a user might ask just about anything, right? That's right. Users may have asked questions that include personal data like their home address or something similar. Engineers who are troubleshooting the app need to know the gist of the question, but not the actual personal details. OK, uh, so we need filtering there as well. That's right. So we can use Google's Data Loss Prevention API again. And for log data, we probably want to be more strict. We might want to exclude all types of personal data. The Data Loss Prevention API lets you set which categories of data to filter out. For logs, it makes sense to filter out all categories. After you've done that, your logs would look something like this. Right. Uh, I can see that all the personal data has been redacted, uh, just like we expect. So the last item on your list was responses to the user. Uh, why would we want to filter those responses? Well, we want to reassure our users that their personal data is safe. This is our last line of defense. We want our model training, our prompts, and so on to minimize the risk of sending anyone else's personal data to users. But if all those safeguards fail, this response filter will stop sensitive data from being revealed to the user. And we'd probably want to filter out all personal data in this stage, uh, just like for the logs? Yes, probably. But it really depends on the application. If the application only helps the user understand the employee handbook, it should never send personal data to the user. But suppose it's a more general HR app. Um, it may let the user update their home address, for example. In that case, it may make sense to allow addresses and replies to the user for confirmation of a change. All right. Uh, so you showed us three data flows. Uh, would an application call the Data Loss Prevention API three times for every user interaction? Well, we want to take the most efficient approach. For example, if we know from the start that we don't want personal data even hitting the model, we can start filtering there and don't need to worry about the other flows. If we only want to prevent personal data from appearing in responses, we just focus on that flow. OK. Uh, so let's say I have an application running. I start using this API today. Uh, what about the, all the data I'm storing, uh, for example, in Cloud Storage or BigQuery? Uh, there may be sensitive data there too, right? And I want to know about that. Right. The Data Loss Prevention API works like we've seen in this video. You send some data to the API, and the API filters out sensitive data. But it can also inspect and classify data that you have in Cloud Storage and BigQuery and even outside Google Cloud. All oh, right. Uh, I guess sometimes you just want to know what sensitive data you have. And other times, you want to actually de-identify it. Uh, so uh, Aaron, how much does it cost to run the Data Loss Prevention API? It's slightly different costs for different features. The team has published a helpful page about how much data you can process for free and how to manage costs when using this API. You should check it out. All right. Uh, thank you for showing us all this, Aaron. Thanks for having me, Martin. And thank you, everyone, for watching. If you have questions for Aaron or me, please add a comment below. Also, let me know what you thought of this episode. I read every single comment. Until next time.